Welcome to this worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. I'm Reverend Jay Brooks, and I minister to this congregation along with my colleagues, the Reverend Jennifer Brower, and our lead minister, the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore. Our worship associate today is Sandra Frank. Music director Michael Smith directs the choir today. Our pianist is Nathaniel Lanasa, and our soloist is Bruce Negron. Today, we welcome a special guest minister, Reverend Lauren Smith, director of stewardship and development at the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. Reverend Smith's ties to Unitarian Universalism stretch back five generations. All the worship leaders and musicians have tested this morning to safeguard your health. We can speak en masse because you are masked to, uh, to safeguard our health, and we can speak en masse because we have been tested this morning to safeguard your health. Together in loving religious community, we care for one another. Ours is a religious tradition that embraces the wisdom of all faiths and values diversity. We use science, reason, and the gifts of the spirit to explore life's meaning and mystery. We believe that you do not have to think alike to love alike. We gather on Sunday mornings to restore the balance of our spirits, to celebrate the joys of life and to find the strength to meet its sorrows. We especially care for all people who are at risk of violence and oppression. Our hearts are with the people of Ukraine who suffer as war and war's violence are forced upon them. May we act, pray, and advocate for a world where nations honor their treaties and keep the peace. Now we enter into a time of worship together. Worship, a time when we consider what is worthy, what brings meaning and strength as we seek to live our values for each day that we have been given. Today our congregation's jazz ensemble under the direction of Dan Pratt offers the invigorating music of Duke Ellington to center us in the spirit of life. Thank you. 
That was wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much, Shelter Rock Congregation and Reverend Jay and Reverend Jennifer and Reverend Natalie for inviting me here. It is wonderful to be here and to see some familiar faces in the crowd, it's very dear. Our opening words are some of my favorites and they are adapted from the words of the Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman. Here in the quiet stillness of this hour, here in the all-pervading presence of the holy, our hearts whisper, keep fresh before us the moments of our high resolve, that in good times or in tempests, we may not forget that to which our lives are committed. Keep fresh before us the moments of our high resolve. Our chalice sliding words are the words of the Reverend Robin F. Gray. Day breaks on our gratitude for family and friends, for the freedom to find our own truth for the company of those who gather here and the promises we offer one another. Let the light of day bring the grace of faith into our lives. The congregation's words of affirmation express the purpose and intention of our gathering in religious community. If you are in accord with the words that appear on the screen, please speak them along with me. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is our prayer to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need. This do we affirm and covenant with each other. To serve human need. Each Sunday, we take a special collection to support a nonprofit group that helps our local community's most vulnerable people. 
Each Sunday, we take a special collection to support, yes, a nonprofit group that helps our local community. This month and next, donations go to Upholding Community on Long Island Interfaith Coalition that is helping refugees from Afghanistan. Upholding Humanity is working to provide household goods and basic necessities for the Afghani families who are here and who need everything. Make a contribution on our website through PayPal or by text messages. Those who are present on site may place contributions in the donation box that is standing to the left as you leave. It's just outside the worship room entrance. In these days when compassion fatigue is real, let us make this congregation a wellspring of empathy and a source for the outpouring of love. This is the day we have been given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. My colleague, the Reverend Susan Moran, used to open most of her services with those words. And her choice was especially poignant because she had been through so much. When I met her, her beloved husband had been dead for just over a year. And she was raising her two young girls alone, navigating her own expansive grief. And yet she began every single time with gratitude and a call to joy, her own variation on the words of the 118th Psalm. I invite you now into a time of meditation and prayer, a time of grateful presence to what is, just as it is. Allow your body, to settle into your pew or your seat, your feet to rest if they can on the good earth or wherever it is they are, your breath to drop down into your belly, and your attention to rest just here, in this space, in your space, in this good company in your body and your feelings and your thoughts just as they are. And we'll keep this silence for a little while together. Paying attention, offering the gift of presence. Into this space, we offer our prayers of gratitude and witness, thankful for the opportunity to bear witness together to the fullness of life with all of its joys and its sorrows. In these days of so much suffering, may we each know peace and connection and love. And in these days when so much feels out of control and beyond our small power, may we have access to center and breath. And may we find the courage to contribute as we can to the healing and reconstitution of our communities and the world. Most especially today, we offer a prayer for peace and healing to those who are in harm's way and suffering, to the people of Ukraine reeling in the shock of a brutal invasion on their land, 
to LGBTQ adults, children and youth caught in the crosshairs of brutal culture wars, to all those displaced and searching for safety, a place to be at home. May they, may we, be well and whole and no peace. Amen. run wild, they beat their chests and they swear we're gonna rise again, and it should have been different, it, it could have been, been easy, easy. Peter Warren died, hatred has gone with him, but here we are, caught in a wildfire,
In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. That's a, a, a line from a song that I learned one summer out at Star Island from my dear friend and colleague, the Reverend Leon Dunkley. The spirit of the song and the harmony break open on the words, it is time now. It is time now that we thrive. It is time now, and what a time to be alive. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. What a time to be alive. Like many of you, I stay abreast of current events, much to my distress often. In the two years since I last stood in a pulpit to preach, this is my very, it is my very dear privilege to be here with you for the first time in a space in two years. In these last two years, I have watched a pandemic explode in our midst. I've seen long-standing racial injustice burst into public consciousness and then continue, largely unabated. I've seen the nation's capital overrun by insurrectionists. I have witnessed threats to democracy at home and abroad that shake me to my core. Attacks on voting rights and Vladimir Putin's reckless invasion of Ukraine just this week. Assaults on LGBTQ people have reached fever pitch and every summer my dear home state of California has burned. Through it all, I have heard fantastical political arguments from the mouths of public officials justifying all manner of malfeasance and gross neglect. Sometimes I have felt like I'm living in the novel 1984 by George Orwell, where up is down and down is up and lies are truth. What a time to be alive. In such a time, what does it mean to lead in love? My daughter Aaliyah offered me some wise instruction on this subject when she was just three years old. Aaliyah is a sunny and loving person. She also has a singular way of speaking. She's now six, but when she was littler, she would latch on to certain words and infuse them with her own shades of meaning. For a while, she was especially fond of the word choice, which I love. If, for example, my husband suggested they go out for cocoa, Aaliyah would nod approvingly and say, that will be a good choice. And if I informed her that it was time for a nap, she was, about, she was apt to bellow, no, that will be a bad choice. <laughs> One of the beautiful things about living with a toddler is that you always know where you stand. Aaliyah also bestowed nicknames liberally. There's a book series by children's book author Mo Willems about an elephant named Gerald and his best friend Piggy. After her first encounter with one of these books, Aaliyah decided that I would henceforth be known as Gerald Princess instead of Mama, and that she would like to be known as Piggy Chickworm. Bear with me, this is all very important backstory if you were to understand the conversation that took place between us one morning before we sat down to breakfast. Aaliyah was sitting at the dining room table and she turned to me and said, I love you, Gerald Princess, and I love our whole family. I was singularly stressed that morning, but I looked back at her and I just melted. I love you too, Piggy Chickworm, and I love our whole family too. That will be a good choice, said Aaliyah. <laughs> and then she paused. And she pointed to a blank piece of paper on the table, and she said, let's put our love choices right there. And then she did, tapping the paper with her fingertips and saying, put, 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 put. Dutifully, I placed my own fingers on the table alongside hers. Put, 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 put. My daughter said, let's put our love choices right there. And then she did. My daughter's words were a clear teaching for me about leadership and love. Sometimes, even in times as complicated as this, it is so much simpler than we make it.
faithful leadership requires that we choose a path of love, a path with heart. Effective leadership demands that we manifest that love in concrete and thoughtful ways, that we choose to give our love where it's needed. It's hard to believe, but this year, 2022, is an election year. An election year in a time of massive threats to people, communities, and the planet. Our democratic institutions shelter the well-being and opportunity of millions of Americans and impact the lives of people all over the globe. They produce policy that can protect or destroy the natural world. Let's put our love choices where it matters, right there. Leadership and love are, first and foremost, a choice, a decision to accept the circumstances that we have been handed, a decision to respond to those circumstances with imagination and creativity and care. A few years ago, my husband Chris and I went to see the Broadway show Hamilton in New York City, thanks to the generosity of my brother and my sister-in-law. It was the best Christmas present ever. And uh, you may know the show. There's a line in it that becomes a motif. Angelica Schuyler sings it first. She's the daughter of a wealthy, influential man in colonial America, and she's captivated by the revolution. She and her sisters, Eliza and Peggy, enter the stage. Eliza and Peggy sing about the danger in the city, the chaos associated with civil unrest and impending war. But Angelica sings, look around. Look around, look around at how lucky we are to be alive right now. History is happening in Manhattan. It takes a special kind of spirit to look around in a time of danger and un uncertainty and see opportunity, opportunity to make a difference on behalf of people and the planet. We're at a watershed moment in US and global history. We're at a crossroads an inflection point. Our choices will determine our future. Not so much our choices about how to think, but our choices about how to act. The choices we make about how to show up for and with others. The choice to listen deeply and share honestly. The choice to restore relationships and reconstitute communities. The choice to be global citizens. This moment demands that we step, that we move fully into the prophetic role of the church, that we accept the gifts of this day, even the most painful gifts, and choose to lead in love. We can begin by getting clear about what we value most and what is most at risk and applying our loving leadership there. I value strong communities resilient communities, capable of facing challenges with resourcefulness, fidelity, collaboration, creativity, and joy. I value the power of strong communities to hold and to heal people and call us forward towards service and connection. You, congregation at Shelter Rock, are in a transitional moment in your ministry, a precious period of discernment. And this is a time of receding pandemic, a time in which all faith communities are in a period of a discernment and reconnecting with what is most important. It's an opportunity to discover and rediscover and remember your own heart. Why are you here? Who are you in the world now? And what do you want to be? I understand that this congregation was founded by a group of families who wanted to create an intergenerational spiritual community. They wanted to provide substantive religious education for children and youth, and they knew, in the words of the African proverb, that it takes a village to raise a child. I hear that that story is an important part of who you are, that goes down way into your roots, and I'm glad to hear it. Children and youth are having a very hard time right now. 
If you embrace a multi-generational approach to being community and serving the world, you can trust that your ministry will matter, that you will do good in the world, that you will be something good, and your congregation will thrive. I hear, too, that you're part of the interfaith, interfaith group that we just heard about, helping to um, settle, assist with the settlement of refugees from Afghanistan who have moved here to Long Island that you welcomed children first and then their adult relations, that you collectively, together with your faith partners, have supported their arrival in our turbulent and inscrutable country, offering hospitality and human kindness. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for the ways you choose to lead in love. Your generosity of spirit has impacts far beyond these walls. And because I am here from the UUA, I want you to know that our association is in your corner. We're here to partner with you and amplify the gifts of your ministry. The UUA has three mission areas, equipping congregations for vital ministry, training and supporting leaders, and advancing UU values. We do this holding in our hearts the vision of a multicultural, multiracial, anti-oppressive association in which people of all identities thrive. This year, we've chosen to advance Unitarian Universalist values by building on the powerful momentum of the UU The Vote 2020 campaign. The ability to make progress on the issues about which we care most deeply, climate justice, voting rights, human rights for immigrants, LGBTQ rights, racial justice, reproductive rights, they all hinge significantly on the outcomes of our next election. In the UU The Vote 2020 campaign, Unitarian Universalists built relationships and made phone calls and wrote, wrote, wrote letters. Were some of you involved in that? Woohoo! UU's made over three million contacts with prospective voters to get out the vote, register and educate people, and engage in values-based conversations. In some ways, UU The Vote 2022 is even more exciting to me because it is so clearly nonpartisan. It's about values, ballot initiatives, and democratic integrity. As UUA President Susan Frederick Ray says, this work is faithful moral action because we hold democracy as a core principle. It's about the inherent worth and dignity of all people, care for the planet, and our commitment to justice and equity. I'm thrilled to invite you to participate again in this effort. Now more than ever, we can see why it matters. Sometimes Americans can be narrow in our thinking. Because this nation is so large and so powerful, we can fail to notice that we are part of a global conflict between democracy and autocracy, a conflict that is often thinly veiled in the language of populism. We need to use every tool we have to protect freedom for all people, to express our affirmation of human worth and dignity by creating societies in which all people can thrive. And it's slow, daily work. We can do this as an act of love, as an expression of gratitude for the creativity and the sanctity of life. What a day we have been given. What a time to be alive. Not long ago, I shared a children's book called The, Sh the Journey with the kids in my former congregation. I started out as a religious educator in my way. My first ministry was a ministry of religious education, and I cherish that. It's the story of a refugee family fleeing violence and searching for a safe new home. And the plot is simple. A mother takes her children and flees from a war zone. They travel in secret, crossing borders, leaving pets and belongings behind, interacting with smugglers and border guards. It's a treacherous journey with many twists and turns. At the end of the last boat ride, the mother spots land. And as the story ends, one of the children looks up and sees a flock of migrating birds. She says, I hope one day, like those birds, we will find a new home, a home where we can be safe and begin our story again. 
This story has special resonance for me this week. And on that day when I shared the book, after I closed it, one of the kids in the class hollered out, it's a cliffhanger. <laughs> exactly, I said. And what's a cliffhanger? It's a story where you get to make the end yourself, another child chimed in. True, I replied, and that is a lot like life. And that is one of the reasons that faith communities, that congregations like ours exist. There are stories going on all around us, stories about the earth and people. The endings have not yet been determined. And so we come together to learn to be the people we need to be so we can help those stories end with love and fairness. We come together to learn how to be braver and kinder and wiser. We come here when hard things in the world break our hearts and we need consolation and encouragement. We give of ourselves to make our faith strong and vital. We contribute our time and our talent and our treasure. Thank you for all the ways that you strengthen this congregation. And thank you for the ways this congregation strengthens Unitarian Universalism and our shared ministry in the world. What a day, this day, we have been given. Look around. History is happening. Let's put our love choices right there. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. It's time to thrive. Now and always, may it be so. Amen. May you go out into the waiting day, 
held in love and touched by peace. And may you go out, bringing love and peace out with you into a bruised and beautiful world. Go in love this day and go in peace. Amen. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of our community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world.